Okay, so I'm going to give a few seconds for everybody to start coming in before I officially get started. I hope everyone has had a really awesome week slap so far. I'm super excited to show you guys today's product and what I have in store for you all. Hi Joy, thanks for tuning in. Okay, so just so you guys know as everyone is coming in, uh, I am just waiting a few moments for people to arrive and then we will officially get started. Hi Joy. Please, as you're coming in, make sure to say hello so I can see everybody that's here. Hey Alyssa. Okay, so as always, I have a really fantastic and different project planned for us today. And we're going to be learning about a really fun new artwork. I hope everyone has been having a great day. Hi Maggie, so good to see you again this week. Fantastic. Okay, so if you guys are joining me again, if this is your first time, welcome to everybody. Uh, so what we like to do here at Hexha at Home, the kids edition, is I'm your host, Lisa, and I'll be showing you guys a work of art either from the museum's permanent collection or something that's currently on view and together we'll learn a little bit about it we'll make some observations look at some details and then afterwards I'll show you guys the project that we will be doing that's inspired by the work of art that we will be learning about today okay all right let's get right into it hi Peggy hi Jess thank you so much for coming guys okay so as always, I have brought with me my iPad to show you guys today's work of art. And as our customary, as we like to do, let's do a countdown. Three, two, one. Ta-da! So I must warn you guys, this might make your eyes go a little crazy. And I think it's even more so uh, will make your eyes feel funny because it's you're seeing it on the iPad rather than in real life. So I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to take this all in, look at it from top to bottom, side to side, try to make your own conclusions, your own observations, see what strikes you first or what interests you about this, and let me know about some of the things that you notice as you're looking. Okay, so somebody said it looks very psychedelic. Okay, fantastic. So, would you guys agree that the longer you look at this, the more it makes your eyes feel kind of funny or like unfocused, and you find that you can't look at it for a very long time? Would anybody agree with that? So, this is actually called Temple of Ochre by an artist whose name is Richard Aniskevich. Uh, so, he's created something very, very unique and interesting here. So we actually consider him an op artist, and op refers, refers to the word optical, or what we're looking at here is optical art. So this is actually a kind of optical illusion. Have you guys heard of that word before? Okay, so Maggie said it kind of looks like we're looking at it sideways. Joy said that we see a lot of crazy lines. Could not agree more. <laughs> Maggie also said it looks like town hall. That's funny. Yeah, I would actually agree with that with those um, thin rectangles that we have in the center. It could definitely remind you of buildings. That's a really nice way to look at it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Joy. I think op art is really cool as well. So this is a kind of optical illusion, and optical illusion, all it really means is that something is being created to trick our eyes into making it look like we're seeing something even though it's not really happening. So in this case, like Maggie mentioned those uh, thin rectangles in the center, they almost look like they're either coming at us or going back in space, like we're about to fall in, like there are holes in the ground. So we're looking at something that's a painting, actually. This might look like it's it's some kind of digital photograph or it might have been done on a computer, but this is actually a painting and was done entirely by hand. Uh, so it looks like 
it's 3D, meaning it's either coming at us or going inside, but it's actually just 2D and hangs flat on a wall. So the artist is tricking us into thinking that the illusion is true, but it's really not, and our eyes are just being tricked. Exactly. And Maggie had the perfect, uh, agreed with me and had the same idea. Awesome. Uh, so when I look at this, it almost seems like the rectangles are moving or vibrating or there's a lot of movement that's being created. And one of the ways that the artist is able to create this effect is because of the repetition of line. So when I say repetition of line, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And it actually doesn't make your eyes hurt as much or make make them like unfocus once you zoom in and you can really see in detail all of those different lines so you can see from far away around these five different rectangles we have these lines that are surrounding them uh, so again when we zoom in would you guys say that there's the same amount of space between each of those lines So when I look at this, I would definitely not say that there's the same amount of space. If you look at the center, we see a lot more of that red color, and then as it goes closer to the edge of this rectangle, it gets tighter and tighter, and then the same thing happens on the opposite side. So the artist is creating a lot of contrast by using the repetition of line and playing with spacing to make it, make it look like those rectangles are popping out or going backwards into space. Okay, awesome. So I, I'm really happy to see that a lot of you guys are enjoying this one. Uh, so because we have all this movement, uh, Richard is really able to create this awesome effect to trick our eyes. So there's actually all different kinds of optical illusions, and this is just one of them that Richard has created in his painting. So with that, I thought it'd be really fun for us to use this painting as our inspiration for today's project. And I actually wanted to teach you guys a new, well, not that it's new, but a cool technique on how to do shading to create a similar kind of optical illusion. So I'm going to show you guys this week's project. Are you guys excited to see? I'm excited to show you. Uh, so shading is a really fun way to make all different kinds of artwork really pop or look more realistic. Uh, and I want to show you guys and break it down in a really easy way that you guys can learn right at home. Uh, so without further ado, here we go, my project for today. And we can look at it vertically or we can look at it horizontally. Okay. And as you guys can see, I kind of definitely took inspiration from not only the optical illusion aspect of what Richard has created, but also his colors, because we were talking about how he had the red and the teal. And then I also used similar colors because I really liked the contrast in those uh, two colors that he actually picked. Okay. All right. Thanks. I'm glad you guys like my sample that I've created. Okay. So this might look a little difficult or might you might think that you can't do it, but I will show you guys a very, very easy way to get this done and you guys can make it in your own way. Ooh, Maggie said it looks like she seashells. Thank you. I think it looks a little bit like that as well. I was calling them like cones or pizza slices. You can use a lot of different ways to call the shapes. Okay. So for today's materials, we're keeping it simple as always, but even though it's simple, we're going to make a big effect. So like I always say, we're going to start with a piece of paper. Now this is just my standard piece that I have for my pack, but you can always cut it in half, you can make it into a square, uh, whatever size paper is fine. If you are a beginner and this is something you're doing for the first time, you might want to start smaller. Uh, so it's a little bit easier and you don't have so much of, you know, white space to cover. Ooh, just said that it reminds her of pipes or spiderweb. You know, once I was finished, I would actually say that it also did remind me of spiderweb. So it's a good catch, good observation. Uh, so piece of paper. 
Uh, for coloring purposes, I actually would recommend colored pencils as being the best choice. Uh, crayons are also really great. Markers or any ink-based type of coloring materials probably won't lend themselves very well to this project because it's not as easy to shade. Uh, so definitely stick with either colored pencils or crayons. Um, I did use scissors. Just You will only need scissors if you decide to cut your paper uh, smaller. I used a Sharpie just for the very end to make my lines, a pencil, and a sharpener. I did a lot of sharpening while I was coloring for this project. Okay, and with that, that is all you need to get this started. Uh, so the first thing that I actually did was I divided my project into all of my different cones or pizza slices or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so what I did first was I really wanted to find the center of my paper. So what I did to do this is, obviously you can measure it and find the center, but what I find easier and less time consuming is you can go ahead and draw a diagonal from corner to corner, do the same thing on the opposite side, and then you'll find your middle point. And then you can leave it there and only have four different slices. Or you can make it look more complicated and add more sections. And to do that, after making your crisscross, you would then also add a vertical line and then one down the center. And with that, it would look a lot more simple, uh, similar to what I have here. Oh, okay, good. So I'm seeing a lot of people are agreeing with the materials and that they have them at home. Fantastic. Okay, so without further ado, once you have your sections all made in your with your pencil. Uh, you are then going to go ahead and get to coloring. And you guys know how I feel about coloring. It is one of my favorite parts of doing any kind of a project. So for this, I told you guys I was going to show you and explain how to do the shading aspect. So to just to get a little closer and to show you guys, before I was talking about uh, when we were looking at Richard and Skevich's piece, that he uses his lines and left different amounts of space to create that contrast or highlights and shadows. So what I did here was instead of using those lines to create the space, I used shading to mimic it. So if you guys notice over here in the corner or in the one side, it's really, really dark. And then when you get to the center, it's very light. And then on the other side, it looks the same as the one we began with. So it's going to be very, very dark on the two sides. And then in the center, it's going to be very light. So when you're trying to do shading, a lot of it has to do with the amount of pressure you're putting down with your pencil onto your paper. So to show you guys what I mean by that, I actually created a tiny value chart. So you guys can see here. There we go. So if you guys can see from here, that this is my darkest shade, and then as you go down, it gradually gets lighter until it's just my white piece of paper. Uh, so if you're looking at this next to my project, let's say, you will see that the corner here is my darkest shade, and then as I'm getting closer to the center, I start moving in those middle shades, and then as I get to the very center, it looks a lot more like that white or the very, very lightest color. So to get these, and honestly, I would say if you have a strip of paper or any kind of paper laying around, before you actually get started with the project, this is a nice way to practice and to experiment and get a good feel for what shading will feel like when you get to your actual project. Uh, and so again, let me do it on a different piece of paper. If I'm pressing down really hard versus really light, you can automatically see that difference. And you can see it again on the value chart. So these are the different shades that we're working with. So you really need the darkest, a middle, and the lightest. So what I would suggest to do first is I would say in each of your sections, go ahead and you're going to make your lightest color and do it all throughout your section. So when you do this, please do it side to side. So what I mean side to side is going from this point to this point. So you're coloring in that way. And it might be easier if you turn your paper, and so if you're going up and down, if that's what you're more comfortable with. Uh, and so once you start with that direction, 
do not all of a sudden go ahead and start doing it the opposite way. If you're doing it side to side, you have to do it all the way down. Otherwise, you're going to ruin the illusion and it's not really going to look like it. Uh, also, when you're adding your black lines afterwards, you're going to keep the direction of how you are using your colored pencil, so side to side. You will also notice that my lines, the black ones, they're actually curved. They're not straight across. And the reason why I did that is because it makes it seem more like it's coming out or it's lifting off the page. So if you look to the side, obviously this is a 2D sheet of paper, but when you're looking at uh, what I created with all the shading, it really looks like they're like bumps and they're coming out at you, but they're actually flat. Okay, somebody said that my value sheet looks like something from Home Depot when you get your color swatches. You're not that far off. This is pretty much what it is when you go to the store. Very fun. Uh, so I actually made an example to show you guys what not to do and what it looks like when you don't follow the directions. So like I mentioned, we have the shading where it goes dark to light. Uh, and my lines are curved and everything is in the same direction going side to side or horizontally. This is what it looks like when everything is flat. So if I bring back, I'm going to put my value. So when I'm only using that darkest color all throughout. And so you can see it looks very, very flat and it looks like I just colored really hard with my pencil and kept the same pressure all throughout. And then if you notice with my lines, they're also straight and they're not curved. So let me go ahead and bring them side to side. So you can see here, there is a big difference between what this looks like and what this looks like. And if you ask me, I think for our purposes today, this definitely looks a lot more effective. Okay, that is today's project. So remember guys, I used two colors. But if shading is something that you have more experience with, uh, you can definitely use more than just these two colors. You can integrate more. But if this is something new and you're trying it for the very first time, I would definitely say to stick to two colors, uh, not one, two. And you're going to be creating a contrast just like Richard did in his piece, Temple of Ochre. So I really hope you guys give this a shot. Please do not be intimidated. Uh, all this is is practice. That's what shading is. The more you do it, the better you will get at it. And I promise you will get it. Uh, just remember to keep in mind the amount of pressure that you're putting on your paper. And the harder you go, the darker the color is going to come out. And the lighter you are, the lighter the shade will be of the colored pencil you are using. So I believe in you guys. I definitely think you can do it. And once you do create this project, please, please upload it to social media. I would love to see what you guys have done. Let me know if you found my advice helpful, if you were successful, if you had any issues, um, or if you have any more questions. I will definitely love to answer and help any of you guys out. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me again this week at Hexer at Home, the Kids Edition. Uh, my name is Lisa. I was so happy to have you all here today, and I'll be back next Tuesday at 3 p.m. right here on Facebook Live. Uh, please follow us on social media and learn about all of the other fun things that we'll be bringing forth, and I'll see you guys really soon. Thanks, guys. Bye. Have a great day.